Good evening. Thank you for coming and sorry for the delay. Actually, we give a few minutes you know, to people to have some refreshment and look at some of the natural products. There was a special event last week, you know, uh, once set by my brother, you know, the and Lord Jew from our village market. And I think they didn't have time, but I asked them to hurry so they should look for the best quality, so they might not be the best quality. Uh, she worked on Jude. I think that my father, oh, my father worked on Jude. And the others are sent by my cousin. Just to show them an example, you know, I, I asked her to send me every, you know, normal uh, kind of stuff that I thought people buy. So, uh, my name is Mohammed Ahmedullah. I will be, I'm, I'm the speaker today, and I will be talking about, you know, the Jude, the Golden Fiber of Bengal. Uh, and it's about, uh, you know, the, how the labor you know, of, uh, of poor, um, ordinary people um, contributed so much, you know, to other people's prosperity, you know, economy, and so on. And when you know the demand for the jute fabric went, and everything is forgotten. Uh, but you know, in terms of heritage and history, it's really important to uh, for us to learn and reconnect, you know, with our past and try and understand the scale of uh, of jute. You know, the role it played, how uh, you know farmers were incentivized, you know, to produce more and how all the different levels of you know, people have been involved procuring and then you know bringing to the factories and, and so on. <coughs> so the story is not really known. Uh, if you are from the Bangladesh especially, you know a lot about jute, even the Bangladesh doesn't produce. Uh, it's not the biggest producer of jute anymore. But because you know jute was so big um, in, in our history and, and everybody talks about it. Um, and people actually think that if jute was you know, found in uh, Western countries, maybe they would have already made so many other stuff out of this. Because Bangladesh is technologically not very advanced and you know, been poor until recently. Is well now. So we haven't been able to use our you know, resources and energy and creativity to uh, maximize you know, the potential of this fabric. Uh, 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 but this fabric has always been, you know, really important. <coughs> our heart, you know, our mind, we grew up hearing um, and seeing and consuming and making use of uh, the youth. So today, um, and I, I'm not going to give you the full story of the youth. One of the reasons is that I don't even know myself, <laughs> right? But also, it's not possible, in, even if I knew in, in 30 minutes or so. I will try and finish this uh, as quickly as possible uh, so that we can have discussion. Uh, I'm not an expert on this topic. I've started to learn about it, and I thought that the best way to learn even faster is by sharing you know, what I have learned and getting feedback and generating a uh, conversation. But I also think, you know, Jude was so important, you know, after reading for a couple of months, that school children should be learning about it. And, and working on you know, the, the craft and, and things like in this country. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to take you through some slides. Um, you know, I'll talk about <coughs> historical Jude, whatever you know, we know. Um, and my personal experience with Jude, and I'll talk about you know, Jude spinning and uh, <coughs> weaving in Dandi and Calcutta. And then, you know, the expansion of British uh, Empire trade and how kind of Jude kind of facilitated and the role that Jude played in, in that uh, and how massive it was, you know. And um, <coughs> then I will briefly uh, cover, you know, some you know, some aspects of uh, the Jude farmers, you know, what they did and what they faced, you know. And uh, <coughs> the some of the way that they were incentivized you know, to produce more and, and, and so on.
This is uh, from the uh, paper. This just gives you an, you know, an idea of the scale of Jude, you know, uh, from around, say, uh, 1850s until um, 1950s, you know, around that time. It was kind of massive. I will just read, uh, I won't read everything, just uh, uh, some part of this, and then you can see this. Uh, the author says that until recently, Australian wool, wheat, and sugar were shipped to the four corners of the globe, um, packed in juice sack. This was about Australia, not juice in Australia. <coughs> uh, and then domestically, you know, some of the products uh, that they consumed and used at home, and sandbags, you know, during wars, um, and juice camouflage, you know, during wars, you know, making those uh, nets to height, height. Um, one thing really fascinated me, I'm going to come to this in a minute, it's about cool girly safe, uh, which was, uh, it's like a freeze, you know, freeze, not freezer, cooler, you know, um, I'm going to come to this in a minute. Can you just have a quick look at this, right? I won't read too much, just uh, two minutes, I think you have a look, please. You can see, you know, uh, get, get an idea of uh, uh, how big the uh, tooth was. My personal experience, <coughs> um, you know, I grew up in a village uh, about north, 25 miles north of Dhaka city. And, uh, you know, Jute has been part of my life uh, since uh, I can remember anything. Um, Jute was, uh, like most house had uh, like a stock of jute, like stock of rice. You know? um, so, and people needed jute all the time to make a little row in all kinds of uh, purposes. You just go and pick up some and make some rope or something else. I don't remember all the different uses. It. But jute was there. The children, you know, we can make ropes like this or eating these all different types and, and make structures and tie things and so on. Uh, but in our village, there was an orphanage as well, there was a girl's section. In the girl's section, there was a craft work, you know, that one lady used to teach the girls how to make crafts from bamboo and jute and other stuff that you can, uh, you can find in the villages. Um, so I saw, you know, beautiful crafted thing made of jute as well. <coughs> we, what, what I, what I found uh, very, so I told you, with my father. In, in, the, in 1970s, right, my father used to, we used to live in Plasto. My father used to go to uh, Dundee quite a lot, and Japan, and uh, Fiji, and, and the Netherlands, following up to that. Um, so what happened after, uh, when Zia Rahman came to power in Bangladesh, he started a massive industrialization process, right? So they were buying up, you know, a lot of uh, old industries, from around the world. And my father had a friend who had a jute uh, mill in Bangladesh. So I think through his encouragement, my father set up a company. And then um, he was supplying uh, all jute machines to companies in Bangladesh uh, who were trying to set up or upgrade you know, their, uh, or expand their, their jute uh, factories. So my father used to go quite often to Dundee, which to hear, I did not know but I used to talk about it. And, and he did that sort. He was doing quite well, you know. He managed to uh, pay for all <coughs> six members of the family to go to Bangladesh in India for holiday in 1980. What happened? 1981, everything came crashing down because he was uh, uh, he was uh, in Japan. He was uh, you know engaged in a kind of major you know co uh, deal you know to get some money from Japan for a particular order in Bangladesh. And then suddenly, Zia Rahman got killed in Bangladesh, you know, the army coup. And then there was uncertainty. 
right, whether this order is going to come or not. So my father, like, gambled, right? He thought, you know, this needed an ex-president, whatever, they will probably continue. So he, he borrowed money from his friend, and he paid uh, the deposit, but the order didn't come from Bangladesh. So he lost, right? So, um, but then, you know, it was bad, and my dad, took, it took a while, but he, he managed to come out of the debt that he got from Warwick. So this is, you know, my personal experience of Jude while here. Also, you see, during the 70s, sometimes we used to get uh, friends or relatives coming from Bangladesh, they used to be in a whole lot of Jude bags and Jude crafty things. Uh, they were looking for markets to sell, but, you know, we are not salesmen, we're not business people. We don't have to go around, you know, look for markets for that. So they just stayed in, in our house or some friends or other relatives came, you know, they kind of too. Um, I actually, when I was researching uh, on the, I came across lots of uh, surprises, you know, that I never even uh, thought about it, right? One of the surprises is that uh, a Tory MP of, of Tower Hamlet used to own a jewel factory in Stratford, which was, uh, I mean, you know, a bit uh, kind of mind boggling, but uh, I didn't even know that a Tory MP is in Tower Hamlet. It's been in labor for <laughs> I'm going to cover this in a minute. Um, the other surprising fact that I came across was that Brazil became a quite a large producer of jute funds. I think their jute industry is kind of uh, finished now, but maybe localized production should take place. And the uh, jute in Brazil were planted by Japanese uh, immigrants in, <coughs> in the 30s, in the 1930s. And at one time, uh, because it was, uh, Brazil needed a lot of jute sacks, you know, jute, you know, jute the kind of packing um, materials because of its export, you know, coffee and, and those, uh, many other things, right, that used to export. And a lot of the, you know, materials used to come from Dandy and Calcutta, right, but then, um, you know, they kind of uh, experimented. And uh, the Japanese immigrant, they managed to, uh, you know, breed a particular variety which actually worked in certain delta regions, you know, in Brazil. And the production, um, they managed to, you know, develop and grow. And they actually, at one time, I don't remember when it was, but for a while they became self-sufficient. They produced as much as they needed. But later on, you know, their uh, thing collapsed when the uh, tariff, due uh, tariff was withdrawn. So then, you know, the industry collapsed. But I'm sure there must be some localized uh, production still going on because they, you know, a lot of people have been growing uh, since the 19, uh, late 20s and 30s in, in, in Brazil. Uh, this is my village here. Yeah? This uh, this uh, uh, jute uh, plants right, is from my village. Obviously, I said we also eat the vegetables you know, when the tender has additional properties as well. This is good for your stomach, but it's also good. I don't know what, but everybody says it's, uh, it's very good for you, medicinal properties. And uh, you know the stem inside of the stem. It's not very strong, uh, so you cannot do much, you know, when you take the, the bark and, and the fabric the, out, um, the fiber out. Uh, but then as children, you know, we played a lot with the stick, but uh, they used to put all the sticks like this, I get by the tip out, and uh, they let them dry. Uh, and we used to use them for fiber, you know, cooking. And also making um, fences, you know, fences, and uh, some people even use uh, for construction, you know, when they making some building, they put in between, uh, and and other other purposes. This is the Tory MP of Tarhan. Yes, right. uh, his factory was in uh, a Carpenters Road, uh, just after you know the flyover on the other side. Um, I got this from an article written uh, in 1876. This gentleman, you know, he set up the, but uh, he had links with Dante, you know, his, uh, his family is something I, I didn't get a chance to actually explore, but, uh, you know, uh, had, had links uh, with Dante. Um, and what he said, there were about 1,000 employees, um, 
and 70% by women you know, uh, of the employees. And the total wages uh, was 26,000 pounds annually for 1,000 workers. And this some examples of the amount of uh, urn and jute textile, you know, the, the factories to produce. Um, but in, in, in 1883, I think, there was a massive fire you know, and damaged um, the, uh, the description, I'll show you in a minute, right, of um, you know, what happened to the, the, the building. Um, but this uh, jute factory was closed down in 1905, right? Uh, but later on, that the building was used to intern Germans who lived in this country during the First World War. So that place has uh, some like interesting history. Uh, yeah, this one is given an example in 1883 June. Yesterday uh, there was a fire and describes you know, what happened. Um, and in a dude coming. Uh, the port and how they were sold. The market price remained kind of steady, good, and, uh, and so on. Now, this is the cool card he said, right? That uh, somebody invented when uh, during Australian gold rush, you know, in the, in the West. Um, I couldn't fully really understand the mechanism, right? But uh, what I understood is that. Uh, this is like a free, uh, and the, the mechanism of heat transfer you know, from inside to outside was jute. Because jute, there was a, it covered, you know, the, the unit, whatever you call it, with jute. And then in some place, it, and inside is a, like a water, uh, what do you say? There's a section which is covered by water, right? And the water sips uh, and the wet, you know, the, the jute, and then the wind kind of evaporates, you know, the water from the jute. Um, so it evaporates quickly, but also good absorbent. So apparently during that evaporation process, the heat is transferred from inside. Uh, so they could keep, uh, you know, food uh, kind of fresh longer in hot Australia and desert. Uh, they used to keep this like near, you know, where, where you know, the abandoned or somewhere where we used to kind of pass. Even it looks like free. <laughs> In terms of um, the history, you know, of Jude, the Jude became massive, you know, during the British time. Uh, but I haven't come across any research which goes into details uh, about the history of Jute, you know, before the British uh, you know, made it so big. Uh, most of the writings I've seen, they give reference to some ancient Indian literature, you know, uh, text which mentions, you know, this, this uh, fabric, this material. And during Emperor Akbar's time, there are references in some writings where Jute was used uh, to clothe the poor, you know, and some other usages. Now, um, when the East India Company, you know, took over Bengaluru, like 1750, uh, but East India Company's direct trade, you know, with Bengal started in the 1630s, uh, late 1630s, if I remember correctly, and from 1660s it kind of took off. And by 1725. The Bengal element was bigger than all the you know, Madras and Gujarat all put together, right? So I never kind of uh, found out what packaging, you know, uh, they used to transport so much. Uh, I know linen used to be used as well before, right? <laughs> but there's no reference to jute packing being used. Uh, but I've seen some references, you know, where East India Company officers are meant, talking about jute ropes. Um, and, and sending some to to, uh, to this country, you know, to to think whether this might be a another product that could generate business for them. Uh, but there's not much uh, kind of written. One thing I have uh, realized is that uh, before uh, you know, before the machine spinning of uh, and then producing the textile. Um, 
jute products, sex, you know, and packaging material were being used. Some references are, are, are there, you know, in, in, in various pieces of writing. Um, and it was uh, like a handloom industry in, in Bengal. Even while, you know, the Dandi were producing so much, and then Calcutta started from the 1850s, and by 1880s, Calcutta overtook Dandi in terms of the, the amount, you know, and the competition that Dandi faced from Calcutta south. And there were others, America was producing, you know, and uh, Germany and, and a few other countries. Um, but uh, the cottage industry, the weaving, you know, hand loom jute industry continued until probably uh, late in the 19th century. And we're still producing a large quantity. Right? But there's hardly any reference to jute products being used in the 18th century. Um, so I'm just, I, I, I'm just trying to understand how this could be. Uh, one thing could be, could have been just localized, you know, the products that were not grown in, in large quantity uh, because people needed rice. Because even historically, you see a lot of export of rice, you know, from Bengal to other countries. Uh, and also uh, a lot of textiles, you know, the, the um, cotton and then various kinds of textiles and raw silk. Uh, but you don't hear Bengal exporting jute, you know or using jute materials, right? So it's uh, still a little bit mystery to me. Obviously, you know, I haven't done enough research, right? Yeah. And so, uh, but people haven't written about it, you know, very scanty kind of information um, about jute, you know, before uh, East India Company started to first use uh, handloom produced textile, handloom textile, and then obviously when Dandi uh, um, managed to use machine to produce the urn and then later on, you know, produce the textile by machine. Then it kind of, you know, became a major uh, material for the British to use in in, in their trade. Um, here, it just gives you some idea about, you know, the export of Bengal um, jute, you know, uh, manufactured jute uh, from 1828 to 94. Um, and you can see it continued, but obviously late it became very low. But even when Dandi and Kolkata was producing, uh, the, you know, um, so that might include uh, <coughs> the Kolkata uh, produced as well. But there's some other place I read, uh, looked at, you know, the uh, the hand loom produced uh, jute that were exported. Uh, <clears throat> just even if you look at in 1850-51, you can see some of the places you know, where the jute was imported you know, from Calcutta, uh, right? Uh, you can see United Kingdom, Hamburg, North America, and then so on, Singapore. At that time, also, you know, like uh, the Britain was uh, developing. Uh, it's a colony you know, in uh, Singapore and, and in Southeast Asia. And uh, because by that time they already defeated the French and the Dutch wasn't as strong as before. So the England, England was, um, Britain was expanding in, in, in Southeast Asia. <coughs> Again, these are just some examples. Right? I took two minutes to read these. These are the only discussions that I found uh, on, on um, history of kind of Jews before you know, the Jews really took off uh, with the uh, machine spinning you know, in that day. Uh, you must have been, do you remember it? I know, it's, yeah. <coughs> Although it's, the story is said to be apocryphal, but Dundee was a flat stone. 
So Dundee had a, an established industry um, spinning what well, linen flax. Um, and it was also a whaling town. And the story is that jute was impossible to work on flax machines until one day somebody spilt whale oil on jute fibers and they discovered that whale oil rendered the jute um, pliable enough to be worked on flax machines. So uh, now I don't know if that story is true but it's definitely true that Dundee became Jutopolis because of flax and whale oil. <coughs> That's right. What uh, what I've read is that uh, so Dundee had long experience of um, you know spinning and uh, weaving uh, coarse materials you know, from uh, you know, the linen coming from a uh, uh, lot of the stuff coming from uh, Russia and the Baltic. But they said it was also grown in Ireland and Scotland, yeah. right? <coughs> so Dundee had a kind of lot of lot you know, long experience uh, with those kind of areas. And probably simplified the one reason why the East India Company sent, you know, to, to Dundee to have a look, you know, to see if they can do something with the with the materials. The stories right? I've heard, I mean they may not be true because I'm not a historian, um, is that they saw this fibre, many of the people who were part of the they saw this fibre coarse fiber, which was much cheaper than flax, and they decided to try and bring it into the UK, into Dundee, and process it in Dundee, but they found it very difficult to process until this happy accident with the whale, the whale oil. But it was a way really of trying to undercut the, um, the flax industry because it was, it was expensive. I've seen some, uh, some uh, prices, you know, like, uh if I remember correctly, flax uh, was about four or five times more expensive, mm. you know, than jute. So obviously, when they managed to produce jute for packing the material, right, then um, then uh, it was really kind of brilliant for them. The money that they saved, you know, by using this material, uh, enabled the uh, companies to make more, more profit, right? Um, yeah. So. Um, so this is uh, one of the back I was looking at uh, you know records and also British newspaper archives. Uh, you know the flags kept on coming to Kennedy, even uh, you know when they do it was due to police, you know, right? Uh, so they probably continued you know, to make use of flex, right? Um, yeah, because the company that my father initially worked for processed both flex and and juice. Uh, so as you can see, you know, this is like uh, coming in, right? And then um, I think this is you know, producing the uh, something like that, and then you know, uh, making that making that uh, producing the textiles. I just uh, wanted to say, it's actually it's actually due to Museum of Dundee, which I've been to. Mm. If anyone's interested. Yeah. It's called mm. Verdant Works. If you ever go to Dundee, you must go. It's a fabulous. I was actually not really logical for this talk, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was impossible. But but it's 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 history now. It's such a. I mean, Dundee was known in my childhood as the jute capital, and now it's just a footnote in history. Yeah, I mean. Uh, It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be a really nice world because, you know, so much from the my point of view, you know, the, I'm going to show you a picture of farm in a minute, right? You know, you can see how hard the work is in the, in the sweating farmers and so on. So all those toils, you know, the product in Pudandi, you know, to be processed uh, for so long, right? Here. And, um, you know, brought prosperity. Um, I mean, the farmers benefited as well, right? Yeah? But then sometimes uh, that benefit, I'm going to come to this in a minute, it was a kind of dangerous benefit as well because uh, uh, they go into situations where they face famine, you know, because of uh, the overproduction of uh, jute. Um, <coughs> yeah, this one just gives you, you know, some idea about uh, male and female ratio, you know, in the, in the kind of jute industry. Uh, what I read and 
I forgot your name. You, my name is Hillary. Hillary, right? Uh, kind of uh, complimented my uh, limited understanding in that uh, because they try to kick the weight, you know, as low as cheap as possible. Uh, so they, um, the lot of Irish women, you know, came to work, uh, and uh, but two thirds uh, were women, you know, workers, and because Irish women uh, were cheaper, you know, than uh, than other local women. And, uh, and it was also easy to recruit uh, additional <coughs> workers. So I just uh, asked somebody, we, you know somebody, they pass a message to Ireland and then someone comes. They weren't quite necessarily easy. coming from Ireland. By then, it was a huge Irish population in all the industrial mm -hmm. cities, Glasgow, Dundee, Edinburgh, that's why they all have two football teams. <coughs> all these industrial cities of north of England have two football teams, one Catholic, one Protestant. Because of Irish migration. It's still interesting. I mean, I think when I was reading about that particular, they were probably talking about a particular period, you know, when mm -hmm. uh, Irish were especially encouraged to come to work because they were cheaper and, and issues. But there was another report I read where um, some of the good owners were actually thinking about finding even cheaper labor than the Irish, right? Who think of getting more labor from uh, the Baltics you know, to come. Which uh, would be cheaper than Irish. Uh, this is the Calcutta. Um, um, you know, some example from uh, Calcutta jute industry. Um, and you know that Calcutta jute industry started in the 1850s <coughs> by an Englishman. I think it was an Englishman or somebody from this country. Um, he had business in uh, in Sri Lanka. And so on. Um, but he was trying to grow something else, you know, uh, work on some other kind of product. And when he came to Dundee, and he was persuaded by a Dundee, you know, a businessman uh, that, you know, why don't you do jute, right? So then he bought the jute machine from the gentleman and established a factory in Calcutta. But as the Calcutta, you know, uh, jute industry grew, in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s, um, um, initially them they were all owned by Europeans and financed, you know, by some financed by locals, joint finance, all, all kind of uh, like combination. Um, then the Marwaris, you know, from Rajasthan, they came and they started to work. Initially, foreign property, not as owners, but as like middlemen, you know. Uh, buyers and suppliers and so on, and later on they also, you know, became owners and part joint owners and so on. Um, in terms of workers in the Calcutta jute industry, initially uh, there were quite a few local Bengalis work, but as the industry expanded, uh, they brought in workers from other parts of India, Bihar, and another place. And the Bengalis became a very small uh, minority, um, and. Many, you know, uh, skilled workers from Dundee, you know, with experienced people, different levels, uh, they also went, you know, because uh, uh, to work in in the jute industry, there were kind of uh, very intimate links, you know, in terms of personnel and people in Dundee and Calcutta. Uh, but um, but then, you know, when Calcutta started to become more competitive, started to overtake, then the Dundee uh, business people in Dundee, uh, they tried to uh, get the British government, you know, to act, to uh, initiate steps to preserve you know, their monopoly or uh, give them a, a chance, you know, uh, so that the Calcutta um, industry don't uh, kill them. Because within the British Empire, right, um, you know, uh, people could trade trade freely, so they couldn't really put tariffs on uh, uh, goods coming from Calcutta, right. Uh, because that would be kind of um, against against uh, against their policies and so on. I don't know, you know, too much uh, uh, all the details of uh, what happened. But I'm just speaking uh, in in a kind of general way. The, the connection with labor carried on. There are people of my age and a little bit older who were actually born 
Yonji people who were born in, in India because their fathers were mill managers or um, mill supervisors or whatever. And it's possible for a Yonji person to go on a, pers a specialized tour of West Bengal, taking them to all the places where they went to school and where the mills were and, and everything, uh, which seems quite bizarre really. <laughs> You mind just having a quick read at this, right? Read to me. This part is just giving some examples again you know, of the the scale where where the products are where. Now, this is a, the, the last one, again, just give some examples of, uh, you know, how much, where, good products, or when. around the world and capital. Um, again, um, jute was uh, something very cheap and it was uh, strong material and it provided, um, you know, uh, the, the, the packing uh, material to transport goods around uh, nearly all the countries in the world. Um, you know, so as you can see, you know, the jute was something kind of uh, very big and even everywhere and facilitated the British Empire, you know, the class trade. And if you know, somebody can sit down and uh, try and work out some kind of monetary value you know, that to produce for uh, the British Empire. You can see, you know, when I was young, I used to see uh, farmers like this working in the field. Um, still work like this, you know. They're very strong uh, because they work so hard. Uh, they don't have any fat. <laughs> but a lot of them, you know, die quickly as well because uh, their body gives up, right? And they get, you know, some of disease and, and things like that. But what the story is this, right? As I understand, is that uh, um, before the British, uh, um, you know, needed um, the you know, for, for their needs. Um, and also before the British destroyed the textile industry of Bengal, 
uh, a large tract of uh, Bengal was used to grow cotton. Uh, because Bengal is one of the biggest you know, uh, producer of uh, textile goods, cotton, especially cotton. Some silk, but it's a lot of raw silk as well for export. But then, when the British destroyed the Bengal textile industry, um, there was no need anymore for Bengal uh, cotton because Bengal cotton was grown by families, you know, around there. It wasn't a plantation. Uh, whereas in America and other places, you know, they set up plantation, they were slaves, and so on. Um, in, in Bengal, the jute was grown in a similar way. It was, you know, like a family base. People knew how to grow it. It was in their blood, you know. They were, you know, a lot of experience. So they didn't need to set up plantations, you know, um, like they did with tea. And, um, and the Dutch did uh, with their nutmeg, you know, in the nutmeg islands. Um, but uh, because uh, people could grow them naturally, so they were just incentivized, right? Um, Middlemen came to them, and you know, and also it was also very exploitative uh, situation um, because um, you know a lot of these uh, farmers, right, they go into debt uh, because of uh, you know they they needed to produce more, right? And also the amount of uh, uh, area for rice uh, kept on shrinking um, because of the you know, massive increase in demand for jute as the empire expanded. <coughs> and then by trade, you know, with the non-empire world expanding, they needed the jute uh, so that more and more land in Bengal were used for jute. Um, and sometime, you know, when the jute demand was so high. The this author, you know, this author, his name is Tariq Morales. In their book, he talks about uh, <coughs> how certain point when the demand was too high, and the farmers committing more and more of the land for two, uh, things became like critical, right? Because a certain slip would, you know, create famine situation. Uh, and also loss of uh, money, you know, uh, so the price of jute meant the farmers were getting less and then they couldn't even use, uh, they wouldn't have enough money, you know, to purchase rice because Britain opened up Burma, you know, and rice from Burma was coming. So even though the less rice grown in Bengal, so they could purchase Burmese rice. Um, but also, you know, the farmers, because they were, they going to big debts. With high, with high interest, um, you know, they were producing a lot, but then they were also paying their debt. And when you know the um, when it was uh, um, like uh, price went down, you know, because of uh, demand, uh, then normally what happened? The farmers, although they family paid, but they would employ landless uh, labor you know, to work and pay them some money as well. So they also needed some loan to pay the landless laborers who worked for the farmers. But when they the demand was low, the price was low, then they couldn't even hire labor, so they had to do as much as possible within the family. And the people who couldn't uh, get the work, then they would be in serious situation. So um, it was. Um, so I haven't done enough reading to really understand, you know, um, the the farmer situation, and also the. The zamindari system you know, that existed in Bengal at that time. How did the zamindars, you know, incentivize you know the farmers, um, you know, are their tenants, you know, to kind of produce this or that? Um, I read uh, one article where, which I don't fully believe or understand, is that zamindari, you know, control wasn't like strong in relation to you know like uh, you know decision to kind of produce jute because a lot of these uh, farmers uh, they could uh, access non zomidar on land you know because of uh, availability of frontier land you know in different places which wasn't under the you know zomidary control but then you know the jute producing areas of Bengal was really vast right so um, um, unless I examine you know the, the data myself um, I won't be confident you know, to, to see how 
the the zamidari, you know, the, the zamidars and their system, you know, um, kind of in, in incentivize or extracted, you know, um, how much supply they accepted or how much money you know, they, ex they extracted from the additional, uh, you know, lands that uh, were used to produce uh, the juice that were needed uh, around the world. This is a conclusion. You know, we can have a discussion after this. Um, what uh, I was thinking, I, I grew up in this country, and uh, you know, we got uh, rice, you know, Indian rice with jute, jute bags, you know. Right? So that's how we kept in kind of touch, you know, with uh, everyday jute, except when few in relative brought, um, or when we went to Bangladesh, you know, bought one of the jute like that. Uh, but jute history is really not really known. Um, even had there been a jute factory, you know, in Stratford, there was another one in Parkham, by the way. There was one in Enfield as well. And along the dockland, there were many jute uh, warehouses. Not of the jute, right? I went to Dundee, actually, came to London first. Uh, then they were shipped to Dundee. Uh, so, that chap decided all the jute are coming here, and a lot of jute, so why don't we have a factory here where the jute is coming? But then jute uh, were coming direct from Calcutta to Dundee as well, you know. And then later on, uh, even Jude started to be shipped from Chiragan to Dundee, right? You know, directly. And I think some Jude were coming to Liverpool as well, then they were taken to Dundee, you know, by separate kind of uh, work. So this area, <coughs> this country, has so much heritage and, and so much links, you know, with, uh, with Bengal, uh, historical, there will be thousands of people, you know, uh, say, especially people in Dundee and London who have had intimate history and relationship, you know, with, uh, with the Bengal. So it would really be, um, you know, a good, a good idea, you know, if uh, we were to encourage you know, people to learn more about uh, this history so that it becomes more knowledgeable and more people are kind of aware. And a lot of children, you know, in school, they would find this kind of uh, history and the links and Know, Bengal farmers' contribution to the world, you know, really kind of fascinating. Just uh, before I finish uh, the weekend discussion, I'm actually working with Bodrul, it's from Stephanie Community Trust. We are trying to develop a project on June, a heritage project on June, which will involve, um, you know, create the memories from older people, you know, you know, like you and the Bangladeshi people, about what they know from the family, right? And, and also do the kind of research that I started on uh, and, and then, you know, um, produce uh, some materials, some exhibitions and some um, video documentaries, maybe a play uh, and, and so on. So, yes, please ask me questions and make any contribution. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, so we saw a picture of the Jews uh, arriving uh, in the Great Big Bends. What had been done to it by that point? What, what, how, what extensive process? Uh, <clears throat> no, I, as far as I know, that wasn't processed, but, um, you know, there would have kind of, um, <coughs> don't let me see you, my knowledge on this is uh, limited. <laughs> but, you know, there's a process of, um, um, you know, when you bring the jute, right, uh, do some kind of shifting, then you produce like a bay, you know, right? Put them together a certain quantity in order to, um, um, uh, you know, upload them in the ships, right? Yeah? To a certain uh, quantity and weight, right? Yeah? So, um, what my understanding is that that particular picture, it, it just kind of arrived, right? Unless you can tell us whether this was um, processed in Dundee a little bit, you know, in the format before it was sent uh, to be made into a. Uh, um, uh, actually, uh, I'm from Bangladesh, I'm actually from Pune, so my hometown. So that was actually most of my time to you know, lots of duty justice. But I saw the city how it died, uh, like. Uh, with the closure of the mills. And later on, uh, I uh, I studied actually in Scotland, so I, I've been touching the Dundee, and over there I, I was doing a project with the uh, 
Asian community. So over there, I actually came to know that in the Dandi, there is a community that is based on, like, it, in a history, they're based on Jew. Like, the KK came here for studies, and then they stranded, and later on, uh, they established their own community. So but, um, that on that point, I was uh, more interested, like, what is the connection between the Bangladesh and the Jew and Dandi. So um, actually, I agree with you, there is not that much literature to, uh, like, get out there. So, um, yeah, like, I, I should be more interested on the project, like how the Jews and other things, like how we interact now with the human geography, and how it reflects on the people's lives like, who actually in Dundee. So, yeah, that's actually quite a bit weird for us. I, I think, um, I think the, even Bangladesh, although it's not the biggest uh, food producer now, because India has overtaken them. But Bangladesh food export has increased uh, quite significantly in, in recent years. So also within Bangladesh, people are getting more kind of creative, you know, more energized you know, to see what but, uh, but they can. But not that much actually. Like, so like uh, what I saw, like when I was child, like, like like the city is based on you, like all the workers and sort of business and But now it is like privatized companies, like they are borrowing. Like very, uh, I don't think that is a massive scale like, in comparison to China and other countries. I was, I was, there, yeah. I was there about two weeks ago uh, in Kuna, uh, went to visit there. Actually, they are exporting now. Rather than processing within the country, yeah. they're exporting to China. So it is quite a big industry. They export uh, to the raw materials. Uh, so you think I'm a fashion designer, so yes. I've done a little collection of my research, I've worked with a lot of um, factories producing high-end tooth product for high-end luxury designers. And they are not uh, accessible to local, the country in Bangladesh, you're not going to get them. It's only for those high-end buyers. And there are a lot of factories that are doing it, and there's a lot of demand for that, especially shoes and handbags. Mm. Um, what kind of high-end buyers do you um, make? A Gucci made shoes, the sole of the shoes, which mm. would, it's a pretty big, um, the footballer, what's his name, the, the famous foot, Portuguese footballer, his shoe brand, Ronaldo, he's making his shoes <coughs> with other shoes as well. And then, um, um, if you even go to Harrods, you'll see jute bags, Harrods have jute bags, that's made in Bangladesh. Yeah, a lot of lot of export are happening. Good quality stuff. Yeah. Those uh, products there, they're not high end. They're, they're like a lot of people, ordinary people, you know, buy this uh, in the market and and uh, what fair business fair, you know, that you can yeah, sure. pick, pick Body shops up. packaging. If you check body shops packaging, mm -hmm. all of them done by uh, and they produce in Bangladesh. Especially, yeah, especially the move towards uh, recyclable uh, the materials. So the duty is, is a recyclable and it's biodegradable as well. That's a, this is one of the selling points, you know, with this new environmental concern. And that has also, I think, energized a lot of uh, uh, you know, people who, are, who understand the market now, how the world is kind of moving to try and see ca cash in. Um, and I have seen actually some YouTube video where they're producing, <laughs> you know, like stuff you talking about, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. right? So, so did you want to ask them? Yeah, yeah um, I was wondering if you have any idea, um, with all this jute crop that was being grown in Bangladesh, was some of the crop only for the jute material or the food, or could the, the same crop be used for food and the material? So, so, so you're leaf, not wasting it. The leaf you use to eat it and the plants uh, you eat. Right, so you can have one crop and have a double use. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are you in, because I think, uh, you know, the, the food, shak that we eat, they they tender. They're not really in the right, you know, right. Mm -hmm. So they are thrown away. But uh, I'm just thinking, because you know, long time ago, I bought some jute seeds from uh, Bangladesh, and I grew in a tray you know, in my window. And it, when it got but it that big, I actually had had them. It's quite nice. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's possible to grow. But I I think looking at this shaft, right? I am just imagining this. I don't know, but you know, police. Uh, more facts is uh, you know when the jute is kind of growing um, you need to weed them you know right and 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 clean them you know and then give them space 
about each one. So they take out bits, you know, in between. And also they, they would, uh, you know, um, get a, this new stems would be growing and they take them off, right? Uh, but I reckon they also grow, I'm just guessing this completely, right? I reckon they, they probably grow shark, jump shark on its own, right? Uh, and then uh, just for eating. They do that now. Yeah. Yes. The farming mechanism is different, but it's the same. You use everything of your plant. You don't throw away anything, basically. Yeah. But uh, to eat, you farm it differently, and to produce it as fiber, you yeah. give more time to grow. Right. Yeah. Um, the reason I'm asking is um, I'm half Egyptian, and in Egypt, jute leaf is a national dish. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this. No. Yeah. Um, so when I we'll invite you, bring some next time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so when I moved to this area, I was really surprised to find that this dead fish is shared by Arabs and, and Bengalis, because otherwise there's like no, no overlap with the cuisine at all. Um, and uh, and I, I was really curious to know the origins, but did it start, because it's been recorded in Egypt since the Pharaonic Fer 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 times, ancient Egypt, and I was trying to look into the origins if it started in Bangladesh or Egypt first, and they seem to have records of them being in both regions at the same time, and both regions obviously have very very fertile riverbanks, they're very they're very wet kind of places to grow stuff. So that might be might be yeah, part of the origin. Yeah. They also have linked to the British um, Empire as well. Yeah, so yeah, 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 absolutely. But but in ancient Egyptian times we've obviously you know British oh, yeah. <laughs> No, but actually you know what I want to want to understand I've read about this but, mm. uh, that at one time from British because you know the British uh, what they do and they they start theorizing about things. You know. They try to explain things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and different officials try to develop his or her own in the field of specialization, you know, whether it's going to be linguistic, right, or or I don't know, uh, ruin, you know, things like that. They, so so the, this is what they do. So one one uh, one such settlement he actually suggested that uh, Jude actually came from uh, Mediterranean originally, mm. right? Now itself looks odd as well, right? Because if it came from Mediterranean, uh, how come it's nowhere else except in Bengal, mm. right? But what I understand, you know, uh, the Jude that you have now in India, or had, I don't know if you about the Jude kind of growing, uh, it was um, through the British Empire, you know, right? Uh, it's like Brazil. It went through the Japanese, you know, but then they were actually sent them to India as well to have a look, to try and learn, you know, how to how to grow jute. And uh, jute growing was experimented in many other places, but it didn't really work properly except Brazil. And <coughs> now I think about ten countries, you know, grow jute, uh, small quantities, but India and Bangladesh is the biggest one. Yeah, I have, I have no idea. If they, oh, sorry, it's just sort of, I have no idea if they grow it for this kind of use to make, I mean, I, I do know that it's a, a huge amount is consumed locally for food and they make it into a soup called mm -hmm. Mulapina, um, but I do know that they make baskets and stuff as well in Egypt and Sudan. Mm -hmm. It'd be more kind of interesting to learn. Also, you see, you can't even tell, you, can, you know, uh, who knows, somebody could have travel in some state to the near you know, <laughs> right? It, it can have uh, things like that. Uh, but it's peculiar because it just grows in, used to grow in Bengal, it didn't grow in anywhere else in India. But now it does, no? because they have uh, they planted it, you know, they've uh, learned to create the uh, kind of environment that's needed. Did you want to say something? Yeah, and quickly, um, it's a tropical weather um, plant, and I think what we need to bear in mind, the uh, jute harvestation, commercial and uh, personal use, Commercial um, harvested, harvestation uh, jute plants tend to grow about 10 to 12 feet, and the local one, which are used for uh, vegeta uh, vegetable eating, is about 5 to 6 at most. And that's the difference, and this is how that kind of distinguishes uh, as to what is the uh, kind of uh, grown for commercial business or uh, uh, making money as opposed to. Uh, Using it for you know, um, eating and uh, not eating. Um, you know, the whole thing, this environmental uh, awareness and climate change issues um, are leading, you know, like kind of new innovations. 
um, even in, in Bangladesh. I, I always thought, right, when I was young, that because about 30 years ago, I went to an office you know, in Bangladesh, and they, they let me sit on a jute uh, chair. I said, how can you make, you know, a uh, jute to make chair? Obviously, they found a way you know, to close them, to melt, you know, make them you know, like this. But uh, I think more people are experimenting. There was a program recently. A guy produced a bulletin bag you know, using jute. It's biodegradable, you know, right? It looks like bulletin. I don't know how strong it is. It's very uh, strong. It's very it's strong. Yeah. So there are, you know, things that are coming uh, along. You know, when you know, creative people put their mind and use their knowledge and experience and monetary incentives, you know, <laughs> then anything can happen. There are branches available in Bangladesh made out of concrete. I have decided. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've seen uh, Shama, I think Shama yeah. put, right? She sent me some uh, images of uh, uh, some dress, you know, she kind of uh, designed and produced, uh, incorporating good fabrics, you know, right? So even, you know, Shama is experimenting. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Trying to bring that again to the mainstream. Mm -hmm. That's it's good. already in the mainstream, but I have passion. I have yeah. two saris. Yeah, two saris. Yeah. But that's not kind of processed jute. Uh, it's mixed. I don't know how they process it, but they are cotton. from Calcutta. Yeah. And I know there was a big fashion about eight years ago. Everybody had to have it. Yes, um, jute motifs in it, isn't it? Mm. They inside the silk. It's yeah. quite beautiful. Just gorgeous. The other thing I learned recently, I mean, this, this field is kind of new to me, you know, but hopefully next year I'll become an expert. Right? Uh, what I learned recently is uh, there was a there was a project in Bangladesh to produce viscose from jute, right? Um, but then the Bangladesh government did a feasibility study using a Norway company. And the viscose was going to be produced in partnership with China, right? And uh, the feasibility showed it's not feasible, you know, financially and everything. So they kind of scrapped it. So what I read recently, um, I didn't even know that you could produce viscose from jute. Or then when I found out you, how you produce, you know, viscose, then again it freaked me out completely. Right. Yeah. And also then I learned how to produce nylon. That freaked me out even more. Right. It's just chemistry, you know, how they. Uh, you know, it's, it's a really wonderful thing. So I think, um, um, you know, what we'll do ourselves, we we'll try and educate people, you know, popularize uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this fiber, you know, and, and, and so on. And focus on, uh, you know, learning the history, because history is like so important. Uh, you know, I mean, you just saw some of it. I think you didn't. Come, you came late, right? Um, I was talking about a something called cool, cool guard. You say that they produce in Australia in the gold rush. You know, uh, it's like a tree to keep um, food uh, fresh, no longer than normally. It's in Australia. Tape. So they use jute as a mechanism to transfer heat from inside to outside, right? So it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of mind boggling, but, but some, so many things are kind of possible. Um, any, any other question? Was there any relationship between the youth exporting to the Britain uh, in the, the time of the Mughal famine? Uh, so can you say it again? What happened? Can you say There was a lot of uh, people died in the Bangladesh, Mughal uh, basically. <coughs> fighting in Burma and therefore millions of people died in Bengal in the rice family. Yeah. But yeah. I don't think it was related to Jute, it was related to the Churchill. Churchill was the Churchill yes ordered that. Yeah. There was no, but they needed they needed a lot of sex, you know. So they might have used more well, space to produce made, the Jew. Yeah, they, the they needed sex for the uh, for the war, you know. 
right? So there could be, could be a link. The there could be some link. The rice was exported to be the British troops in Burma. But then if they needed more facts, right? The war effort. And also uh, even transporting the goods. No, at, some, at some point, at some point, at some point, according to the uh, the, uh, the paper that you showed there, uh, that they, they converted a lot of land into producing jute, mm -hmm. and they compromised the production of the rice. So that there, there would have been a point where the rice, mm -hmm. you know, grown locally, would be less than what's required for the, for the population. That's right. and, and because they were making profit from Jude, so that should go away. But then that changed after a while and it went to be a uh, yeah, okay, well, that plastic to go away. Yes? Oh, the plastic, plastic to go away, yes. But that, that would change now. It was from the 60s, I think this, uh, what's it called? Only something that was produced in the 60s. Um, yeah, only it's very But you know, the paper. Properly, that's what they used to replace the backing of carpets when the Jude industry was done, and it was only properly. But what I was thinking, I mean, it's not just Jude, that's a, a repeating story in the history of the British Empire and Bengal. First it was opium, so everything, cash, opium was cash cropped. Mm -hmm. And then after the opium wars, that kind of um, had to stop, so it was indigo, uh, and then Jude uh, and whatever, basically beggaring people because they're forced to grow cash crops mm -hmm. um, as opposed to food crops. Also, the scale, you know, the scale of, I mean, I've seen some um, um, on the internet, you know, one minute, I've seen on the internet uh, a, an exhibition where a black woman, you know, she produced uh, some drawing on uh, a fear, you know, textile, two textiles. Um, this to reflect uh, kind of the experience of slave, you know, right? But she used tea and coffee color, you know, to produce the images. Um, so there's stories about, uh, you know, slaves and Bengal Jews, you know, in Jamaica, in America, right? Uh, so the story of Bengal Jews touches every country in the world nearly, right? So I think uh, in a different way, but mostly packing, you know, material. Mm -hmm. So I think it's so important that we, we understand this uh, more, better. Sorry. Um. <coughs> Right now, um, jute isn't, uh, or is, is jute also produced um, in small family units? I remember when I was when I was a kid in Bangladesh, I, grew, I, I lived there for a few years, and Nali Shagon is one. You know, my uncles produced it. Now, I, I, when I go around, I don't see um, much being produced by families. Do you know whether it's just? Um, you know, gone out of existence in uh, no. day to day no, use no, by families. So no, they're growing more now. now. Yes, it's, uh, <laughs> you find them everywhere. It's locally grown. It's also um, grown as a farming. So, uh, yes, yeah. yes. no, but that's that's in is that in the commercial farming or is this local uh, families um, doing? Both, both, you know, both. they're not some commercial farmers, right? But. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, even Bangladesh, you know, the rice growing and other crops, right here, from dal to spices, right there, done by family, you know, own farms, right here. And they could be very small or could be bigger than very small, different size of plots, right? Uh, but in your uncle's case, right here, maybe, um, you know, his life changed, he became more affluent and moved on to something else. No, no, the whole fact that my entire village, I know, I go back, the, I don't see, I, I can't be completely sure that I paid attention, but at least I know on our big body, there's no, I haven't seen, or no nali shakes have been uh, given to me for food. I've been, I've been to the last, uh, what do they get for food now? <laughs> that might, that might, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, what? be a clue, right? Well, I mean, I don't, the usual vegetables, uh, of, of dal and yeah. those things, uri and, other things about well, obviously also fish. We we are uh, we're from Sudet and somewhere is, uh, there's a lot of um, fish. I, I think the answer maybe you ask your uncle, you know, with the fish chance. Because but the you can, you can is good to grow Silet wasn't a big Pasha but they were small, you know, it wasn't a big, you know, uh, jute growing area, Silet. 
Like, like Mutu said, that if you want to grow it for food consumption, mm. you don't have to allow it to grow up to like, the height of the moon. So you can grow it anywhere. And we, I have seen, like I said, like came back uh, about two weeks ago, and they, they are going to grow it. And it's interesting because Jucha, Jute, ba uh, Bamboo, um, there's another, um, um, something that we used to call, uh, if you're Sileti, you might know it, Murta, which was um, this other plant we you'd uh, be able to use it to tie, um, uh, not bet, so or, make, or make furniture as well. Or make furniture has gone out, people are not, I see my cousins who live in Bangladesh, they're no longer uh, farming in, it's, it's whatever's there is from 20 years ago. Um, but you know, you know the other thing happens, right? This is, uh, I was reading an article about Silet. Whatever, you know, a lot of people in London and America, they own a lot of land in Silet. They, but then that's not uh, used, you know, productively, yeah. right? Yeah? Exactly. So that could be what, you know, a, a reason to explain you know, a lot of uh, underused land, you know, in Silet, right? For crops and things like that, right? Um, this is based on an article, you know, because there's a lot of absentee, absentee landlords, right? And if you don't own your land, you know, and because all days, you know, you have to work on the land, you know, to earn, uh, to get rice and whatever. But now a lot of people own land from here, you know, and in America, places like that. From, from my observation, uh, once I was there, a lot of the land is taken over by plastic. Mm -hmm. You find plastic everywhere. So uh, I would be surprised that the plastic is not, you know, allowing to grow things as, as they were able to. Uh, Many years ago. Plastic is a huge problem in Bangladesh. Do you mean waste? Yeah, plastic waste, yes. It's just, you know, I, I would say I would be wrong. No, that wouldn't explain why it's uh, you know, by other places. No, it affects me. It has more to do with transformation and modernization, and what it is often people are kind of moving from rural to urban locations and they are leaving something behind and trying to focus and find a what you call modern way of living the quality. So what I think ask your uncle and then you can share with us. Yeah, but it's got, it's, 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 I was actually just texting the son just now who lives in who lives in who's moved from the village to the town yeah, to yeah, to right. try and his family are in the, the village, but he's in it to try and get some Job. cash. That's exactly what That's it is. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm. Um, no, 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 no. Generally, throughout Asia, people have uh, this big trend that <coughs> people moving from uh, villages to the city life. Mm -hmm. So they rather do labor in the city than stick around. And also, if you look at say, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. In the villages, right? There lots of women. You didn't see them anywhere. They used to be stuck inside. They were not allowed to go out, right? Uh, but with the government, now, because they're bringing money, uh, that that social stigma is kind of gone because they're the, who is earning the money now. Right? Still have women face still have a lot of problem. But in the villages, uh, nearly most households, uh, some women are gone now. You know, they work in urban centres. You know, earning kind of money. That's it. And a big transformation from 20 years. Same applies to men as well. Huh? Often men are, uh, what do you call, them, settling from rural uh, to urban and finding alternative work, uh, earning and supporting and, and feeding their families. That's what it is. I managed to do that before by the smallest scale now. But you didn't, women didn't do that unless uh, they work in people's homes, yeah. poor ones, you know, mm -hmm. like their servants. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But now, like say, for example, in uh, 30, 40 years ago, if you go to Dhaka, for example, in the shopping mall, except, um, except uh, say, New Market, you don't see women anywhere, right? You go to Vaisal Mokar, anywhere, you don't see hardly any. But now they're everywhere on the streets. It's because of this uh, movement, you know, to move in the industry, government industry, and work in the government industry, so they kind of change And that's a more liberal as well, that's what it is. But if you, their presence is very strong now, right? They're everywhere. They're also buying a little bit of money to buy. Uh, I came from, you know, to be able to power right? So things are kind of changing uh, because of the city, you see that? Some people, you know, a lot of families have one or two children, uh, Europe or America or Canada or uh, some other countries, maybe Middle East, and uh, they do send money back home, their ladies and their brothers don't work. 
that yeah. are the of them, you know. Yeah. So they are the one who actually abroad rather than you know their brothers sisters working outside. So they enjoy more life, but they don't work. You know. And yes. they don't see farming as a profession. No. Look down upon it yes. in Bangladesh. I saw yes. it. Yes. They think farming is not for educated educated people. It's for no. rich poor people. They rather do anything. They don't want to do anything. Yeah. yeah. You from Punjab? Yeah. yeah. You know, Jat are they farmers normally? Jats are farmers. Yeah. But I remember when I was young, I used to meet a lot of Punjabis and they used to be very proud. They used to say, my chart head, or something like that. Yeah, because uh, uh, in Punjab, when people talk about farmers and uh, compared to the rest of India, Punjab and Haryana are two states. Jats are basically landowners as well, said, not the big time, but uh, they own the most of the land and they grow food and other stuff, and they're well off. They're not poor. They used to express a lot of pride, yeah. you know, when you... They're not them. poor. That's why when you have like a farmer's protest uh, for one, one, nearly 30 months in India, near Delhi, yeah. and the people actually were surprised. These people are not farmers. These people are rich. They're eating all these uh, 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 pizzas and other stuff. Uh, because uh, traditionally, people in India think the farmers are very poor. But uh, when you come to a state like Punjab and uh, Haryana especially, they are very, even some part of the Pakistan as well. The uh, farmers are not poor. I'm not, I'm not talking about all of them, but there are, there are some farmers who grow vegetables and other stuff, yeah? They might be poor, but the majority of them are rich. You will see that in this country. Yes, <laughs> yeah, some of them, yeah. So they, they have like a, just to take a tractor to protest here, yeah, they were spending like a, uh, 10,000 pounds rather than uh, Indian money, you know, just to, uh, to, to show off. I'm just going to say, just um, I'm going to history note. Um, the Kilgarnes they have a historic collection. Which, uh, you, it's not on public display, but you can make an appointment. Uh, going back to the 1850s, uh, not just the fibers, but objects. And, uh, so if I'm giving my email, yes, please. You, you, are you from there? I, I live in Scotland. So oh, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we are developing this uh, new project. Right? What we'll do, we'll write to everybody details about the project. And it'd be nice if we can get feedback. If you want to be involved, support us, and we can wait. Because we really want to take you know, the story. And also, people like Seshnam is trying to uh, popularize this. <laughs> 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 popularize this. Right? I have amazing ideas, but there's no funding. <laughs> but maybe there's some creative things <laughs> come out of this. So I have a question for you. Are you identifying the group? Uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a historian. So I'm doing, yeah, I'm doing work on um, what was back in the 19th century, it's called economic botany, which is this whole idea of uh, moving plants around the world and growing them on a commercial scale. How did the Japanese create a, 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 a variety that what would be the process of creating a variety that was suitable for a Brazilian uh, de Delta kind of variant? Yes, uh, I don't, I don't have that knowledge, but I, I, I know people who do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, all these things really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if you wanted to do a presentation project, you almost individual a workshop you would make a design and make it. Uh, it's called genetic modification. But they do it then? Yeah, basically, if you, if you have, say, a thousand seeds yeah. and you, you uh, try to uh, grow the thousand seeds, uh, you, you'll find that maybe 10 out of a thousand will be successful. And then you go on from this 10 out of a thousand, and then eventually you come to a crop that will survive. <laughs> Because that's what you do, it's a, 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 like a Darwin's theory, uh, survival of the fittest. But so you don't need it, but it will automatically, naturally. Naturally, like so everything else. Like no, but if you take it to a different environment, like say Brazil, yeah. or in a, in the Japanese actually experimenting with, right? That's pretty fair too. Uh, because they were also producing, you know, I went to Bolivia last time, and they told me the rice that I bought was being uh, produced by the Japanese. Right? Because in the, you know, the, the Amazon area of Japan, 
sorry, uh, Bolivia, not the you know the islands, right? Uh, the Japanese were the one who bring the rice there. This is what I was told. I don't know if it's true or not. But uh, but the rice this is very funny. What they say? Rice like I cook biryani with that rice you know, for people there. I cook biryani with that rice you know, for people there. Artificial rice. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Huh? The first it was. Uh, Tasteless, you know, when I was experimenting cooking, with, and also it was <coughs> the 4,000 meters high, for 3,000 and the water, you know, the, the boiling, the cooking process is uh, very different, right? Uh, but then when I cooked the when I cooked the biryani, I told the lady who arranged that I'm not confident the rice is going to be perfect. So she says she knows an indigenous lady who can cook perfect rice. So she came, I prepared the chicken and everything, right? I said, now you add the rice and make this perfect chicken. <laughs> so, so it was all right. I got pictures, I sent everybody who, who booked the ticket. Just so my biryani in, in Bolivia. <laughs> just uh, one thing, was my presentation all right? Because I just did a uh, research for a few weeks. So. Thank you for coming and uh, really contributing. It's been really kind of wonderful to know about it. And someone who has a direct, you know, family links with the uh, Dandy work. Uh, and uh, did you, did you, uh, did you book to even have you got your visit? Can you finish uh, the refreshment and have a look at those good friends? Thank you. 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 Thank you.